Welcome. My name is Lisa Murray. I am the City Historian and I'm glad you've joined us today to explore Sydney's history. Today's talk is Look Up Sydney from the Ground Up and our presenter is Margaret Betteridge. Margaret is our curator and she manages the City of Sydney's Civic Collection, a fascinating collection of artworks, furnishings, memorabilia and official gifts. Her book, Sydney Town Hall, The Building and Its Collection, explores the historical context for these objects and their significance for our city. She knows that every object has a story. And these stories add to our understanding and appreciation of what we see around us. Today, Margaret is going to guide you on a virtual tour around the city and inspire you to look up above the street level and see what you can find. Over to you, Margaret. Thank you, Lisa. Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's talk for History Week 2021. I hope you're all well. And for everyone in lockdown, I hope that this talk will bring you um, a little bit of joy and inspire you to look at the city when we're back um, open again in a different light. First of all, I'd like to thank um, the Cultural Venues Program team, uh, the History team and the Curatorial team for all their assistance in helping um, to produce this. These Zoom presentations take an army of people behind the screen and I'm really appreciative of the assistance that they've given me. And thank you to, to Kylie and Rebecca, our Auslan interpreters today. I'd first like to acknowledge the Bidjigal and Gadigal people, the traditional owners of the land that I'm speaking to you from in the Eastern suburbs of Sydney, and pay my respects to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders, elders past, present and emerging. So I'll give you a little quick outline of the talk that I'm going to give today. Over the many years that I've been working, I've had some terrific opportunities to study some of Sydney's heritage buildings inside and out. And I'm fascinated by the 19th century architecture of them and the ornament uh, that decorates them and the craftsmanship, um, which has created um, so many fascinating features on, on buildings and, and landmarks in the city. The idea for this talk uh, came out of lockdown really, and the knowledge that it will be a while before all of us can walk our streets in the city and connect with the landmarks so familiar to us. I'm missing Town Hall, the place where I work, and all my friends in the civic collection, um, the objects that I manage. But it's been a great opportunity um, working from home to be able to access um, so much of the material that we work with and continue the work that we do. The Civic Collection is a um, fascinating assemblage of objects, artworks, historical and civic memorabilia, portraits, Sydney Town Hall furnishings and official gifts. And the artwork that we acquire today for the city um, documents the changing face of the city and its community and is really collected for future generations to enjoy and get a sense of where we are at this point of, of time. So I've combined all these missings and created a virtual walking tour along Sydney streets, looking from the ground up to some of the details on city buildings, which perhaps you've not seen before. And I've paired these with works from the Civic Collection, which interpret some of that detail um, and illustrate um, different artists' interpretation of our architecture and ornament in the city. So the image I'm starting with today is a fascinating view of Sydney. It's called a bird's eye view, and it represents an artist's impression of how the city might have looked to a bird flying above the landscape below. This one was drawn by um, Arthur Henry Fullwood in 1888 
for a centennial souvenir um, insert into uh, a newspaper. Forward was very well known as an artist, uh, an architectural um, skilled drafts person who drew for the picturesque Atlas of Australasia. And he captured um, in this image a really extraordinary impression of what the city looked like. Because remember, there was no technology to elevate somebody to the height from which he would have um, imagined this view. It's a fantastic image to delve into because you can see the smoke from the steamers um, traveling in the harbor, the crowded wharves and foreshores of the warehouses along Darling Harbor. And I think what's perhaps most striking is the prominence of some of the city buildings, particularly the spires of um, the churches and landmark towers. And you can see the tower of Sydney Town Hall and the GPO in quite good detail. Forward was actually very clever because when he drew this drawing, the town hall was nowhere near being finished. It had been intended to open for the centenary of the founding of the colony or Captain James Cook's um, arrival. Uh, sorry, the founding of the colony in 1788. And um, he drew this from the drawings and plans that were available to him, um, but it was not an accurate representation of what um, in fact was built. Um, <clears throat> So we're starting our virtual tour from Sydney Town Hall in the heart of the city. On the left-hand side is a watercolour by Simon Fieldhouse, who's an architectural um, genius. Um, he has drawn many of the city's buildings um, in quite extraordinary detail in his pen and watercolour sketches. And he often includes a whimsical touch to them. And here in the foreground of Sydney Town Hall, is a man carrying a bag with a little winding clock in his back, um, presumably a reference to um, the tradition that used to um, be that the clock was wound by hand three times a week um, by a clockmaker. We now, we've now converted the clock to an electric movement and um, it no longer needs to be um, wound in the same way. But looking up at the building, uh, there's a very definite protocol to the flying of flags on Sydney Town Hall. And we found that out during the Olympics when we were, um, we were in receipt of quite a lot of flags and, and interest in having international flags flown in the building. We hadn't fully realised that there was indeed a hierarchy with the Australian flag right at the top, the state and the Aboriginal flags on either side. It's a little hard to see, but the city's flag in the centre. And there was also a flagpole projecting out over the steps where once upon a time, the council used to raise the flag for um, different national days of international countries. It's a little tradition that no longer um, survives. The image on the right-hand side is of a uh, textile that was created by um, an Indigenous artist, Carla Dickens. She works with found objects, um, does a lot of work with fabrics, and she scrounges around um, getting pieces of fabric to create her artworks. And in this one, she has um, taken the Australian flag and reworked it to um, sort of describe the um, seven um, sisters um, Dreamtime songline, which is important to her and her ancestors. She was inspired to do this by the stars of the night sky, and she incorporated stars um, in the flag um, as a sort of a reference to the stars of the Southern Cross and Federation on the Australian flag. And in this work, she is attempting to reclaim the work and, and the, the history of her um, Aboriginal um, people. Some of the landmarks that we'll be visiting today are some of Sydney's best sandstone buildings. 
they were made of Piemont sandstone, quarried locally. And this stone is a very fine textured, honey coloured stone that not only um, is beautifully um, manipulated by sandstone carvers, but the buildings give the city a very warm yellow um, honey coloured glow, particularly when the sun falls across them. I found some lovely quotes that extol the beauty of the sandstone in the city. An article in the women's column of the Sydney Morning Herald in 1923 took pride in the character of Sydney, proudly comparing the brightness of the city to the fog-stained cities at home and enthused that Sydney looked undeniably beautiful in the morning sun as we drove our English guests through the streets. Particularly admired were the town hall, cathedrals, and many other public and private buildings built from the handsome yellow freestone from local quarries. And another journalist went on also extolling uh, the stone's pra praises and calling um, Sydney the Queen City of the South. So when you can, take time to enjoy the beautiful carved ornament on Sydney Town Hall. And if you look closely, you might find some lions um, on the sides of the building, including one that has always been part of the myth around Town Hall, which is that um, the, one of the lions has a slightly, uh, we call it a winking eye. And the myth around this was that it was based on one of the stonemasons who used to um, stand at the corners of the building to line up the stonework and of course closed one eye in the process of doing that. And um, that one of the stonemasons um, took that um, and made a little caricature of him in the line. If you look high up above the town hall for the roof, you'll see some really interesting detail. And in this slide on the left, I've juxtaposed the neoclassical stonework um, of um, the first part of Sydney Town Hall um, that you see from the street. And this really interesting slate and wrought iron tracery work on the mansard roofs, which um, you can see at the corners of um, the first part of the um, stage of Sydney Town Hall. And the image on the right hand side by Brian Dunlop is a detail of his interpretation of one of those mansard roofs. What you can't see up there on the roof are the 240 solar panels which were installed in 2010, which can um, provide um, electricity into the grid um, and uh, for Town Hall. Sydney Town Hall was the first clock tower to be erected in Sydney. And in 1873, although unfinished, the aldermen invited journalists to climb the a series of ladders, I think probably very perilously um, placed to reach the top of um, what had been finished by them, offering them the opportunity for the first time to see the highest vantage point across the city. As part of recent stonework um, works, we have had engineers um, brace the clock tower. After the Newcastle earthquake, it was considered that um, the uh, structure of the um, clock tower needed to be braced. And so um, that work has been, um, has been completed. And in the process, we were able to completely restore the clock, which you see on the right hand side. And for many, many decades, clocks like these, and we'll be looking at a few more, uh, were important in the daily lives of people because they are what kept people on time before mobile devices and, um, and, and um, wristwatches. So the clock um, on Sydney Town Hall was installed in 1876, um, the first one. And we're not sure why a replacement one was ordered, but it was. And it was duly installed in 1885. There was a ceremony where the mayor um, started the clock up and, and um, enacted the chimes, uh, which could be heard as far away as Balmain and were also 
um, to be used as a fire warning in case um, there was fire. Um, you can see on the right hand side of the left hand slide, um, the opaque glass clock face, which uh, was lit by gas at night time in the 19th century. And the um, chimes that ring out every 15 minutes are the Westminster chimes. They were written in 1793 in England for the uh, Great St Mary's Church in Cambridge and originally called the Cambridge Chimes. Um, they're famous now because they were installed in Big Ben, at the um, Houses of Parliament in Westminster. And from about 1851, they were known as the Westminster Chimes. Um, for those of you uh, who are musical, you might be interested to know that the bells are tuned to the key of F major and the hour bell sounds on the note of E. So next time you're passing the town hall, do look up and have a look at the clock and perhaps hang around for the Westminster chimes every 15 minutes. We commissioned a photographer, Peter Murphy, to climb up to the top of the town hall and take the view from outside, from inside, looking outside. We did this because we purchased a set of 12 um, panoramic, or they were sort of still photographs, which had been taken from the clock tower by Francis um, Robinson in 1873. And we got Peter to stitch the 10 photographs together to create a 360 degree panorama. And at the same time, we got him to climb up and take the same view uh, from the clock tower as it is today. And I think we were all struck by the fact that the landscape in 1873 was, um, was fairly uniform. And there was a, an opportunity to see a very expansive view across the city um, in contrast to the view from the clock tower today. We sometimes have tours of the clock tower. Um, and when Sydney Town Hall reopens and it's COVID safe to do, um, we hope we can reintroduce those. When you're inside Sydney Town Hall, don't forget to look up there either. Uh, this, these photographs have been taken in the vestibule in Sydney. Peter Murphy has created some of the images I'm using today by stitching 360 degree views um, inside the building to create some quite artistic photographs. And on the left hand side is the, you can really appreciate the Moorish detail in the plaster work um, in the vestibule. This plaster work is exceedingly fine and was modeled by plasterers and strung on pieces of thin wire, which were then um, suspended across the roof of the double cube space. So they're an amazing feat of craftsmanship. And um, again, well worth uh, looking up to the ceiling. We sometimes have people lie on the floor um, in the vestibule on open days to um, capture views like this one. On the right hand side is an image of the panels of stained glass in the dome right above the chandelier. These panels were the or are the first um, locally made stained glass here in Sydney. And the figures, which were called caryatids, are allegorical representations of some of the virtues that I think council aspired um, to. Um, to demonstrate through their work, so justice, mercy, peace, peace, truth, and so on. They're quite typical of the sort of sentiment um, of um, mid and late 19th century architecture. And we will see a couple of examples later on of these used elsewhere. Perhaps you might come to Sydney Town Hall in the future for a concert or a graduation or a speech night and climb the stairs in the north and south staircases to, to be seated in the gallery. You'll see on either side of the main hall some spectacular stained glass windows, which were designed by a Frenchman, Lucien Henri, for the building in 1888. Um, as I said, um, 
before the building wasn't completed just in time for those celebrations. Uh, so the windows, um, although they're inscribed 1788 to 1888, um, were installed before um, the building actually opened in 1889. And here, Lucien Henri has depicted James Cook, um, celebrated navigator, um, and acknowledges his visits into the sort of South Pacific area um, on the endeavor and the discovery and uh, it's a reference to his scientific um, observations there with his telescope. On the other side of the main hall is perhaps my favourite um, ornament in Sydney Town Hall, which is this magnificent window titled New South Wales, and again made and designed in celebration of um, the centenary in 1888. This um, window has a figure in the centre which is an allegorical representation of some of the um, uh, sort of attributes I suppose of the, the young colony. Um, on her head the figure is wearing um, some coiled ram's horns and down um, along, across her back flows her hair which is made of wool. She carries a lamp of knowledge or perhaps a miner's lamp and she holds a trident as she stands on the globe that's called Oceania, the ruler of the seas. What I'm particularly interested in are the representations of the um, flowers that look like little weeds. And you can see them along the bottom and at the top and the bottom of the side panel windows. That's a plant called Stenocarpus. And Lucy Nonri, who designed these windows, was very taken with the architectural quality of Australian native flora and he worked his designs around um, these to try and promote to locals the beauty in Australian flora and encourage them to use that in their, in their design work. Um, so to celebrate um, Lucy and Henri's love for um, all things floral, we have a number of acquisitions that we've acquired that promote that idea of beauty in native flora. So in this image is on the left hand side a, a watercolour by Lucy Henri himself of Stenocarpus and on the right hand side is a contemporary um, painting by Bruce, Bruce Slorach who is part of the um, team that uh, produced the wonderful Australian flora textiles at Utopia Goods in Paddington. And if you've never been to that store, it's well worth a look for the, the absolute beauty of their designs. And he said that he was inspired to create this design, which is used on scarves and um, furnishing fabrics, from a visit to the town hall where he looked up and saw um, Lucy and Henri's work, wanted to know more about this particular artist and was inspired, as I said, to create this painting. So we finish at the town hall with two artworks by an Aboriginal artist called Christian Thompson. He's a Bajara man. Um, he's an artist, a sculptor, a photographer, a videographer. He's a student of Aboriginal language and a very distinguished academic. He was the first Aboriginal student to be admitted to the University of Oxford. And in these two works, he explores something that's very central to his um, life and practice. It's the identity of race. And in these two images, in different um, ways, he's the silent observer, one behind the mask of Captain Cook, and on the right, um, he's slightly revealed behind a wreath of Australian native flora. So those two work have a resonance with the, um, the windows that we saw before. Just across the road is the Queen Victoria building. And this artwork by Laura Courtney, Laura Courtney um, shows the afternoon sun hitting the building, a little bit of shadow and um, 
the town hall in the same in the same frame. These buildings are often painted and depicted together, and they're a very important part of the street streetscape of Sydney. Uh, the Queen Victoria Building was built um, as a, um, a, a, a sort of um, it replaced a market um, building. Uh, that had been previously the um, central markets for the sale of produce and um, live, livestock. Um, and the uh, desire to upgrade the building was um, one of the city's projects to um, improve the, um, the facilities for the markets, but also to produce a design that was um, quite significantly grand in, in this in the streetscape, as I said. And so um, one of the uh, people who was involved with the design of the Sydney Town Hall, George McRae, who was city architect, was given the job of designing this. And in, he produced a number of designs, but eventually the council decided to go with the one that uses the Romanesque style of architecture. In the city's collection, we have this striking portrait of Queen Victoria, after whom obviously the Queen Victoria building is named. Uh, this portrait was acquired by council in 1873. They wrote uh, through the um, premier of the time to get permission to have a copy made of the, this portrait. It was uh, um, painted by uh, Franz Winterhalter, who was one of Queen Victoria's favourite artists, and um, permission was granted and um, a German painter called George Hoberwein um, copied the painting, um, and which now, which hangs in Buckingham Palace, and uh, the painting duly arrived and was hung in the vestibule in council. It's now in um, the um, Southern Staircase, where you can see it in all its glory. The painting depicts um, the Queen after her coronation. It was painted actually some years after it, but it shows that um, juxtaposition of, um, you know, uh, that idea of um, the, the sort of state and um, the crown responsibilities that, um, that she had to bear with the representation of the crown um, as, as the figure of royalty and the palace, uh, the Houses of Parliament at Westminster in the background. Like the Sydney Town Hall, uh, the Queen Victoria building has a really extraordinary roof. Um, this time it's um, the use of domed um, structures around the top of the building. It's sometimes a little hard to get far enough back from the building to fully appreciate the extent of this roofscape, but it's full of uh, fantastic architectural detail and also statuary. And again, some of the statues around the, um, the building use that same allegory um, with um, rep references to um, some of the virtues um, that we heard of before, wisdom, truth, justice, and so on. Um, the, roof um, scape has been painted by many artists um, but some of the statuary is even more interesting. This is a figure um, arrangement of um, classical men draped in um, clothing um, of the neoclassical period and it was an extraordinary work by the sculptor William Mackintosh. Um, is one on the east side and the west facade of the Queen Victoria building. Uh, the models were made in plaster here in Sydney and it's thought or claimed that they were modelled on um, Percy Cavill who was one of Australia's first swimming champions and the plaster models were shipped to Italy and the marble statues carved and then shipped back here. Another view of the domes is this contemporary work by Jeff Rigby, um, which shows the extraordinary detail in the copper sheathing around, around the domes. 
the Queen Victoria building is full of stained glass. Um, it's most visible in the um, entrances from George and York Street. Um, but again, uh, a riotous celebration of colour, although I think a lot more municipal rather than allegorical and um, full of, me of the meaning that Sydney Town Hall windows have. When you're next in the Queen Victoria building, remember to look up to the, um, the domed centre um, area where again, there's beautiful stained glass, which is offset now by this extraordinary colour scheme, um, which was installed uh, a few years ago, which really makes this um, interior of the building. Thing. And I thought you might like to just see the little staircase um, wrought iron staircase in the photo of the right hand side, which provides access up onto the, um, there's a, a walkway around the central dome, and you get to that by um, climbing that little staircase. We have in the collection uh, four watercolours by an artist called Arthur McIntyre, who died not very long ago. And for those of you in the um, audience who were um, perhaps more of my vintage, you may have listened to the ABC's popular radio program, The Argonauts Club. Arthur McIntyre was the artist expert on that radio program. And he judged for many years um, the competitions of artworks that um, children sent in um, to the program. So it's really nice to have that little piece of um, Sydney history in our collection. The Queen Victoria Building was opened on the 21st of July in 1898 by the Mayor uh, and Mayoress of Sydney. And they walked across from the Town Hall to the ceremony where um, the uh, Matthew Harris, who was the alderman at the time, um, opened the building and the mayoress was presented with this spectacular key that was designed by Sydney Goldsmiths, Fairfax and Roberts. The design was created by the architect, George McRae, and the key was made in solid gold and featured a, um, a scale model, uh, representation of the main dome of the building. And the decorative ornament um, and scroll work underneath that uh, was, was copied from the scroll work over the main entrance to the building. Uh, very spectacular um, key to be using. So we're going to leave the Town Hall and the Queen Victoria, but not before looking up uh, as these photos were taken. Um, I do love on the left-hand side, the hatted gentleman here who's cleaning the clock face of um, the, the Sydney Town Hall clock um, with his rope harness. And on the right-hand side, the photograph of um, the workers on the Queen Victoria building uh, standing around the little parapet um, that encircles the, the dome, enough to make a work health and safety uh, inspector um, shake, I think. So we're walking down George Street to uh, the General Post Office. And in this view by Alfred Tisbar in 1883, um, we see an interesting street scene. Tisbar was a scene painter at the Paris Opera, but like Lucien Henri, he was um, sent um, out um, in um, not so much prison centres, but exiled from France for his part in the Paris Commune. He came to Sydney, taught art here, and he um, painted a few views of um, Sydney street scenes, including this one. So you can see the um, general post office in its first um, iteration. It's the building with the clock that's projecting out over the street. And you can see that there are stores um, in the space where Martin Place is um, just below. Um, the clock is um, still there, but it's not nearly as prominent as it appears in this view of Tischbauer's in 1883. 
And I think another point of interest um, is the extraordinary telegraph pole, which is a sort of harbinger of uh, the way things were about to head in the colony. On that facade in George Street is this extraordinary coat of arms, which is a very, very early rendition of kangaroo and emu um, a side, on either side of a shield with the, um, the heraldic line above and a motto that appears on many um, Sydney buildings and um, is, is a sort of motto for the, um, the imagined prosperity of the city in the same way that Eturia was imagined for the Romans. Um, but we see these figures of um, our native animals uh, slightly shackled and I'm not sure that um, perhaps the, the sort of understanding of, of that um, is perhaps something that we would be wanting uh, really to represent today, but it's a really interesting and very early coat of arms. On the um, Martin Place facade of the GPO are some interesting details. There's a very, very large statue of Queen Victoria, again, carved in Italy and brought out here for installation in the building. This um, coincided with the expansion of the GPO to a design by colonial architect James Barnett, and it really heralded the start of um, a huge change in communications and um, uh, the, the grandeur of that building shows just how important um, the whole issue of mail, te um, telegraph, and eventually telephones um, was to um, underpinning the business and, and um, domestic lives of the people of Sydney. Um, on the right hand side are again uh, figures that represent um, the arts, the sciences, um, the, the sort of aspirations of um, people um, that the government really hoped would be in embraced by the community. In the centre is perhaps the most extraordinary part of piece of um, ornament on the GPO. You can see these carvings on the Pitt Street facade and they were very controversial when they um, were completed. They were the work of a man called Tomasino Sani, who was an Italian immigrant um, stone carver and mason. And they have a slightly cartoonish um, look to them. They depict the lives uh, of ordinary people. Um, there are postmen, fishmongers, sailors, um, barmaids, printers, all sorts of things, uh, professions and, and business um, jobs that um, people held. But they are slightly, um, uh, not crude, but they, they certainly um, caused a lot of angst uh, when they were completed as being um, contentious, but also people felt they were demeaning. And there were lots of arguments in Parliament about whether they should be removed or not. And in the end, they, they stayed. But um, there's a, a lot of really interesting debate in the parliamentary handsets about um, people's opposition to them. The clock tower of the GPO was dismantled in 1942 during the Second World War and um, it remained, um, the building remained without its clock tower until the 1960s when it was um, replaced. But uh, again, there are some pretty horrific work health and safety photos in the archives of, um, of it. The, um, the clock tower was important from all sorts of points of view. Uh, during the war, they were worried that it was an obvious target for an air attack, um, but it had previously been very, very important for Sydney siders because 
it was the um, the highest sort of place that could be seen from the, the greatest distance. And it had a series of flags which were flown from the top of the flagpole, um, which w warned people about impending weather events. So if there was a big southerly buster coming up from Wollongong, a flag would be raised uh, from the top of the GPO to warn um, citizens to hurry home and take shelter. Uh, in doing an exhibition a few years ago at Customs House on maps, I found this really interesting uh, map in the collection of the State Library of New South Wales. And it uh, depicts the mail signals that were flown from the top of the GPO tower when the mail steamers were arriving. So if you had loved ones and family in England or America or France or wherever, uh, and you were expecting letters or parcels from them, you could check on the progress of uh, these vessels um, into Sydney Harbour. There were flags that would say that these ships were on approach and flags that would let you know that the, um, the ships had docked and that the mail would be available for you. So walking a little bit further towards the quay, we come to Customs House. And this drawing was given to us by a fellow who had been to Sydney in the 1950s, late 1950s. And he had sketched a number of Sydney buildings and he was very keen for this one to, uh, to come into the City of Sydney's collection. And as you know, um, the City of Sydney runs a very successful library and exhibition space in the, the building. And when Sydney reopens again, we'll all be looking forward to going back into Customs House again. Customs House had a really interesting um, architectural history and went through a number of changes from a, a quite a modest um, sandstone building to um, an enlarged building, which you can see on the left-hand side with the clock and a triangular pediment. And then another story added on to the top, another two stories added on to the top subsequently. And um, again, of course, um, there's been a much more recent addition with Cafe Sydney that sits on top of that again. So it's a building that's undergone quite a lot of interesting change. And when you look at the facade of the building um, and you know about a little bit about the history of it, you can tell um, exactly how um, it's been adapted during those phases, but the retention of the clock and so on um, and the carvings has been um, fairly significantly um, addressed. Uh, some of the detail is fantastic on Customs House. Again, here's another um, royal coat of arms on the building above the triangular pediment at the entrance. And inside the triangle is the badge of New South Wales, which is used on the state flag and um, is part of the heraldic language um, for New South Wales. It was designed by James Barnett and um, uh, still is in use today. And the clock is interesting. It has some maritime associations with tridents and uh, figures of um, sort of slightly allegorical dolphins um, on either side. Another interesting feature on Customs House when you look up at the facade are these medallions which um, run around the, the last extension to the building and are carved with the names of ports. When we were doing some research a few years ago, we were really hopeful that we might find out a little bit about the rationale for them and how they came to, um, to be selected um, for inclusion as architectural ornaments. And unfortunately, all the leads went cold, and we have never been able to work out what the, uh, that whether there was a hierarchy, um, whether they were all um, imperial colonies, um, whether they were uh, places where Sydney um, traded um, uh, significantly, and it still eludes. So um, it's another piece of work um, to keep the historians busy. We're just going to walk past Macquarie Place. 
and I'm not sure whether you've ever stopped to look up at the huge plane trees um, that are growing in Macquarie Place. There's a little plaque at one corner which records the fact that the Queen and the Duke of Edinburgh planted two trees in the park in, during their visit in 1954. And these two plane trees were the commencement for the Remembrance Driveway, which terminates in Canberra. And anybody who drives um, down the Hume Highway um, will, will, is driving on what is the Remembrance Driveway, which um, bisects off to, um, to Canberra, um, just south of Goulburn. The Queen and the Duke of Edinburgh were um, given these two very decorative um, spades, which they used to plant the trees, and these are in the civic collection now. And I saw this sculpture on the right-hand side in an exhibition, and the leaves were so realistic, they just looked like the fallen plane tree leaves that you see in Sydney um, during autumn. And um, this was an acquisition that we made um, for the civic collection, just to remind us of the importance of these plane trees, the street trees in Sydney. They were chosen uh, particularly because they, um, during the 19th century, it was found that they could cope with the grime and um, polluted air in uh, large cities. And so um, they were a, a favourite of street tree um, urban planting. Across the road um, is a, a two buildings in Bridge Street, uh, which are significant uh, as public offices. Um, in 19th century New South Wales government days. One of them is the Lands Department and the other is the Chief Secretary's building. And we return to Simon Fieldhouse's um, sketches uh, here, uh, where he's drawn the decorative grills uh, of the front entrances to both buildings. And uh, these are also in the civic collection as a little reminder of architectural detail. Bridge Street was um, a really thriving administrative hub um, in the 19th century for the New South Wales government. Here is the um, clock tower of the Lands Department building. And you may not know, but look up next time you're walking past at the domed roof. This um, is often called uh, the onion and it, um, was designed to take a telescope through uh, its roof, although that was never installed, and the whole of the dome rotates um, so that for celestial mapping, you get a 360 degree um, view of the, the night sky. I realise I'm running out of time, so I'm going to speed up and show you the statues on the side of the Lands Department building. Here we see surveyors and explorers that were important in um, New South Wales uh, lands history. Uh, the one on the right-hand side was recently um, added to the building, uh, sorry, um, whoops, uh, and depicts the former convict James Meehan, whose maps are um, an outstanding record of really early colonial um, settlement uh, in towns and um, landscapes in New South Wales. The Chief Secretary's building um, on the corner of Macquarie and Bridge Street was the um, place where um, Sir Henry Parks had his office and it was also the home to a lot of um, significant government departments like health, child welfare, the Aboriginal Protection Board, um, gaming and liquor uh, licensing. It was a, a very um, significant um, centre for uh, administration. And um, the, what's interesting in this building is the fact that it has three different entrances. The one on Macquarie Street is the grand entrance um, for the Premier um, as the colonial secretary, as he was in those days. The sandstone carving of the Royal Coat of Arms was created by Neville Rann, our former Premier's great-grandfather, Thomas Valance Rann, and is a superb piece of um, sandstone carving. 
The facade again has the New South Wales badge in the triangular pediment, and you can appreciate the beautiful honey coloured sandstone um, there um, on the facade of the building and the Romanesque um, ornament. This was the public entrance, it was on Bridge Street, and this was the one where most of the traffic would have passed through, and is the one that's depicted in Simon Fieldhouse's um, sketch. Um, so it was a, a, a very um, busy part of that uh, corner of um, Bridge Street. And then the Secretary for Works, this is the Public Works Department entrance, and it's where James Barnett, the colonial architect, would have walked uh, through uh, to his office in that building. Moving very quickly, um, on the exterior of the building are some sandstone statues. Please have a look at these when you walk past. They are fantastic pieces of sculpture that represent, again, um, the attributes that um, the government and, um, and local government sought to encourage people to, um, to adopt. Wisdom, mercy, peace. And these ones have been added with art and science and um, reference to some of the finer parts of, uh, of life. Passing the Hyde Park Barracks, here we see the building completely surrounded by um, the additions that were added on to house the Supreme Court when the Supreme Court used to occupy the building. We're going to look up um, to the clock, which has recently been restored, um, which is the oldest operating uh, public clock in uh, Australia. And um, the, fellow, the gentleman standing on the right hand side is Andrew Mackerink. He is the um, whiz that services all of the clocks from Central Station to the Town Hall to the Lands Department. Uh, he's a master clockmaker and um, an absolutely fabulous technician. And uh, I don't think there's a public clock in Sydney that he hasn't worked on. Behind the uh, facade, the uh, clock face, is a mechanism which Andrew has completely restored. And by making reproductions of um, the original pieces, that clock will go on, he reckons, for another 200 years. Moving very quickly along um, to get back to the town hall uh, through Hyde Park uh, made me think of the birds. And we have a lot of paintings of birds and wildlife uh, in our collection, uh, partly because they were used as ornament in some of the decoration in Sydney Town Hall. On the left hand side is a magpie drawn by Bruce Gould in a woodcut and a very new acquisition, which we haven't even put up yet, um, by Stephen Treblecock of. Uh, Laura Peets and Wattle, which was donated by the Friends of Sydney Town Hall just before lockdown. We have a lot of fun with these birds. They are very popular artworks in the Town Hall House offices and were created by Egg Picnic, a firm of graphic designers and obviously bird lovers. Um, but they're a lot of fun and um, they were selected to uh, be used on some of the city's hoardings, you know, um, the program that the City of Sydney has for um, trying to make streetscapes of the city under construction a little more engaging. So looking up at those birds um, was a little sense of um, fun and, um, and enjoyment from them. They, I think they just make you very happy when you look at them. Um, the bird cages at Angel Place are a very favourite sculpture with people in Sydney. And this is an ode to the forgotten songs of birds that no longer um, can be found in the city um, due to the, environment, the environmental impacts of development. Some of these birds um, have been recorded uh, as being in the city, but are no longer, unfortunately, um, able to um, be seen or heard. And this sculpture has an audio component um, in it. And you can hear the sounds of birds that have been mastered by um, some of the ornithologists in the Australian Museum. So if you have a chance to walk through Angel Place, look up and see these bird cages. This was originally installed as a temporary exhibition, but it was so popular that uh, they, the um, bird cages that uh, were originally installed, which were ones that were just picked up at um, markets and sales, 
were replaced with much stronger and more durable steel cages. <clears throat> In this image, um, I wondered about what birds think of Sydney and, and um, their, their views of um, the landscape that we take for granted. So when you look up in Sydney, you can quite often see yeah, birds perched on, um, on the sides of buildings. These ones on the left are on the Sydney Harbour Bridge. On the right is a sculpture by English woman sculptor Tracy Emmon, who, who has um, created some birds as part of a sculpture called The Distance of My Heart, which is an achingly beautiful work about homesickness and um, things that you miss. And um, again, along Bridge Street on the ledges of quite a lot of the city buildings, you can see these little bronze birds. And here are two who've taken up residence on a ledge outside the Museum of Sydney. Um, I thought it was interesting when I was doing um, some reading for this talk that there are over 120 species of birds that people um, have recorded now in the city. They do that with a, an annual bird count. And included in that are peregrine falcons, which can be seen above Chifley Square where they roost. So we're back to the town hall. And in this view of the town hall and St Andrew's Cathedral, are uh, some seagulls caught in the nightlight um, of um, Sydney Square, um, circling around um, the building, another artwork in the city's civic collection. So just finally, um, it, my observation in doing this talk was that the setting of buildings is something that is some something that we should really en enjoy and celebrate. And Sydney Town Hall and the Queen Victoria Building have one of the best settings, as do the buildings in Bridge Street. When you look at an image like this one of the city, um, it's hard to think about what might draw your eye upwards to look up. Um, at the buildings because there seems to be a bit of uniformity um, to them when you see them as a landscape uh, like this in this aerial view. But all is not lost. Uh, these are two images that Ken Woolley, um, uh, before he died, uh, drew my attention to, which his firm Anchor Mortlock and Woolley had taken or commissioned Max Dupain to take when Town Hall House was completed. Um, in the 19, late 1970s as the office building uh, for the City of Sydney um, Council employees. And um, I was struck when I looked at these that perhaps there is no ornament, perhaps in the brutal architecture um, of these buildings, there, there may not be the warmth of the Sydney sandstone, but the angles and the geometry um, really drew my attention to the idea that perhaps in the, the 20, uh, 21st century, we could be inspired to look up and see ornament and building um, architecture in quite a different light. Um, and if you're interested in uh, walking the streets of Sydney, can I draw your attention to a culture walk app created by the city? which is called The Stranger's Guide, Sydney 1861. And it takes a, um, a visitor's guidebook uh, of Sydney in 1861 and walks the streets describing some of the city buildings. And some of those survive in the city, some don't, but the walk is intended to um, show a little bit of a different view of um, our city. And uh, next week, uh, Assistant Curator Rebecca Anderson is going to be talking um, uh, from the ground up, but she's going to be looking down. And I'm very excited to hear her talk and her observations using the City of Sydney's collection. And that concludes my talk. Thank you very much. <laughs>